No. You turned okay. up the game sound and I turned it down some just so that it wasn't super loud. Um, no, so okay. it's perfectly okay. No, the game sound is coming through. Oh, okay. Not too bad. Yeah, pretty livable. <clears throat> Hindenburg's probably the strongest AA threat on the field. So yeah, not too bad. Either though, I think that's a quite strong have defensive AA with that thing. The what now? Oh. The Udaloy, Udaloy, the tier, the tier nine Russian DD. It's not. You can rocket plane. The Russian DDs, even if they have defensive fire, their base stats are very low. So yes, it's noticeable, but no, it's not very powerful. Okay. Try to let it regen all the way up. Every time you hit the button. Uh, it's going to stop regening for about half a second before it starts to give you boost again. So the more times you hit the button, the less it's actually regening. Uh. It can be tough to do that in the heat of a fight, but in the early game, you know, every little advantage counts. Uh, so should we go after Udaloy or should we continue scouting? Uh, I'd prefer to get more information. Let your team know what they're going to walk into. Let's so use the radar. Okay, interesting. Are you looking to strike the Yamato? Why are you going so far south? Uh, no, just looking at the chat. Yes, ooh. Well, nice one. Run away. Cool, so you got a good amount of information at this point, so you can just strike, and then, you know, strike and go home. Let's <clears throat> yeah, set fire and be smoking. Mm. Yeah, too, too. Don't watch. Next. Mm -hmm. You spend five seconds watching every shot, and you see ten shots, you just wasted 50 seconds of time. So once you take your shot, it's dialed in, be done with it. At least, you, you know, if you don't have forward. another attack. Try to cruise control. Oh, yeah. Because otherwise you're just running down your boost as you cross. Cruise controlling is going to add just a few more seconds. I think it's something, something like four to six seconds as you uh, traverse from A to B. But it's the difference between needing a, a consumable or not. So. Go see if we can get Edinburgh. Uh, the Edinburgh yeah, probably not. wasn't... He probably went behind the island, so he's likely still going further south. Yeah. Remember, when you left-click to drop the bombs, you're going to want to start turning for the follow-up attack. Yeah. And strike the uh, FTG if uh, you feel like the Edinburgh is not going to happen. So this is where not having any boost is a problem. Although last gasp helped you out, so you get to drop with two planes. Maybe. Cool. Rockets. So see, the problem with Torps here is if you're going to work on the Edinburgh, he can just turn. Now he might want to stay behind an island so he doesn't get shot by any of your friends and you could move him with Torps, that is true. But if you're trying to have a direct damage interaction to stop him from capping, then you're going to want rockets in this situation. You, uh, you want to burn through your boost, you want to get on top of the Edinburgh, you need to get resets. Go to the other side of the island, the other side of the island, there we go. You want to have an attack line. He's close to the dirt, which means you're not going to be able to strike from the left, you're going to have to go off this way. Boost, engine consumable, get on top of this guy. Okay, south, south, get to him. <laughs> I know you're going to set up the shot, but we still got to be moving in the direction of the bad guy. Ah, uh, so we're not able to rescue that. 
so drop and bail. Drop and bail. Drop and bail. There's a fighter. Drop and bail. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. There we go. So we lost those planes. Uh, you can always just left click, drop, spam left click, skip, and just spam the F key to get the hell out. Because the planes, yeah. the fighters are going to take a little time to warm up. Uh, good I news is... So, I was hoping to get on the SDG, but I was too greedy. Yeah, there was no way that was happening. Uh, so, good news is we tripped across the submarine, so that's some good information. We need to move our carrier. There's no defense in mid, so we're going to want to use all these dudes over on the 9 line to be our new defensive front. Dealing in the smoke? Oh, yeah, the Edinburgh smoke's going to be there for another, like, 40 seconds. Uh, so you're not going to get much out of here other than spotting the sub. Too soon. He's too low for you to interact with. But you can drop a fighter here. Here. Drop a fighter. 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 Yeah, fighter. Gonna... Fighter. 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 Thank you. <laughs> you're trying to <laughs> drop it away from the Edinburgh, and you're trying to put it between the Edinburgh and that rock with the island. Because if you dropped it closer because you wanted to spot the sub or something, then it's just going to get shot down for free. So you don't get anything out of that. You have to drop it in the north. And what that fighter can do is, if the sub continued going north, he would be spotted and have some kind of interaction that's going to help your sub shoot him. And we need to stop using torps here. We need to use rocket planes. Because you're striking in Edinburgh, and the Edinburgh can move. If there, are, if there aren't guns actively shooting an enemy ship, they just turn. And then they juke the torps. Now, yeah, if it's I a battleship or it's something extremely that. slow, then yeah, you can torp it. But otherwise, you need it to be locked down so that you have an attack. Now, you never want to skip rocket planes. Unless you're recalling, you never want to skip rocket planes because that's going to allow your planes to get further away from the short range AA of the ship you just struck. Yeah, let's go forward again. Okay, that looked like there was some really rough targeting. You were swinging back and forth there. Were you yeah. trying to mouse and keyboard crazy or? Yeah, it's bad Chicago tactics. Back and try catching you from uh, you know very acute angle, which never works. Yes, that does not work on the U.S. line. The rocket planes do not function that way. Yeah, I'm not going to mess with that, actually. Yeah, as you, can see. you are all over one. these torpedo planes today. Get a fighter on the sub. Get a fighter on the sub. Get a fighter on the sub to your right, to your right, to your right, to your right. Turn to your right. Drop. Just drop and turn to the right. Heal. Drop and turn to the right. There's a sub to the north of your planes right now. You're not going to hit the Edinburgh. Go find the sub. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, please get out of this. Go find the sub that was briefly spotted to the north. It's on the 6 line. It's on D6. You need to spot that so that your sub can have an interaction with him while you can know he's there. Also, you need to move your carrier to the right. To the right, not that sub, a different sub. You need to turn to the right now. Yeah. It And you need to move your carrier when you get a chance, because he's got torps out on you. He just Auto pinged you. Mode enabled. Fighter, drive him below the waves. Now that should, if you're U5-5201, whatever, has... Can you F3 him? Can you say, hey, look, please, there's a thing here? All stations. Reporting the position of a strategic target. So hopefully your sub wakes up and has some kind of ping interaction for this. And also, you do have a Harakaze that's making stuff happen. Now you can work on the Edinburgh. Torpedoes astern. Torpedoes astern. Torpedoes to port. Torpedoes to port. Okay, once you finish with the Edinburgh, there's a destroyer at D5 that's going to be harassing your destroyer. You need to work on him. That's Sen Yang, you need to work on the Sen Yang. Yeah, you probably want to get bombs out for that if you can, but I mean, you're close enough with rockets that that's fine. Just be ready for the next strike. 
Torpedoes the starboard. Can we see where the torps are? Right, they're gone. Cool. So let's get spotting on the sub. He's almost out of depth time, which means you can bomb him. He's going to be forced to the surface. The Balao is a US sub. It has no depth consumable that gives it like additional depth timer. So when you spot him, you're going to have him, uh, he's going to rise to the surface any moment now. So be ready to bomb him. And uh, unfortunately, the Bismarck is getting close enough that it'll shoot down a fighter, but you can still linger him if possible. There you go. Do the thing. Unfortunately, because he has one or two seconds worth of depth time, oh. well, nice, so he's dead. No. Woot! Um, because he has a few seconds of depth time, he could dive back under the water, but uh, he took a, two, took a few torps up the butt, and uh, he's dead now. So do remember that you place flak and the little back and forth wiggle stuff, you know, it, it does work for you, but if you're going to place flak doing the wiggle, once you get past the flak interaction, there are a few times where you end up turning into where you placed it because you're like, ah, good, I'm close enough now. Yeah. You, you can't do that. Ideally, you want to place flak away from the spot that's between you and your target as you start getting to that three and a half to four kilometer mark. Because once you cross that barrier, you're gonna be through the flak and then you can start aiming and doing what you need to do. Uh, find a good line for the hidden burn. Yeah, so coming in from the north is gonna be much better than the bow on stuff. damage. You have an engine boost consumable. There's no reason not to use it. Oh, just... I, um... Try to use the last gas. Yeah, well, that also is just waiting for your planes to die. That's true. Well, this one looks pretty sealed up, which is nice. So try to work on your cruise control, just as, as a practice. Because you're in for a long haul here, so you'll run out of boost long before you end up seeing anything. So for those that are in the audience, cruise control is where you're going to accelerate all the way up to the maximum speed of your planes, and then let go of the... take your foot off the gas, let it kind of coast down, until you've fish, filled up your boost bar again and then run it back up to full. So doing this technique, you'll use about 20 to 25% of your boost gauge, which means by the time you actually get to the enemy, you have full boost or close to full boost. See, there we do the turning into flak thing. So the wiggle is okay, but you have to know where you're placing the flak. Because there are a few times where you that last flak puff gets placed directly between you and your target. You need to be turning. Don't forget that once you drop the bombs, you can start turning to already begin your follow-up turn.
Mission reached. Autopilot mode disabled. So when you place the flag, so you see the first sh um, the tracer shot, you turn. Then when the explosion happens, you turn the other way. One more time. So when you see the flag, um, you see the tr tracer coming in, you turn one way. And then you see the second set tracer coming, you turn the other way. Or do you come at a kind of obscure angle, for example, you come, you come this angle, then you try to place the flag here, and then when you fl flag's placed, then you, um, for example, attack here with the dive bombers. So let's look at the Tashkent. If you point your nose, or, okay, that's, Tashkent is there. So if you point your nose at the Tashkent right now at 3.6 kilometers, the flak is going to spawn between you and the Tashkent. So at four yeah. kilometers, three, four kilometers to three and a half kilometers, you don't look directly at the Tashkent. You're going to point your planes slightly off to the side so that when that flak wave happens, it gets placed off, uh, off to the side, which then you can turn in and go to the Tashkent. So for example, if you look at so, direction. so go to the and Edinburgh, then... for instance. At four kilometers, don't look at the Edinburgh. Look a little away, away. And yeah. now 3.5, we cut in. That. Yeah. So, or maybe at like 3.6, you start to cut in. Or 3.7, you start to cut in. You're going to want to put the flak off to the side so that you're going to have a way in. Because if you're just kind of like doing the wiggle thing and your wiggle happens to time where you're looking at the ship you want to kill... When the flak wave happens, well, then there's a flak wave between you and the ship. And then eventually you get close enough that you just have to commit on the ship, which means you fly right through the flak and you get nailed. Gotcha. It looked like you just complimented yourself. <laughs> uh, I know you no, didn't, I but it looked I like it. <laughs> I wish I could, no. Okay. Yep, yeah, I think I did a pretty good job there. <laughs> so, lessons to be learned from that match. Uh, there were a few times where we had interactions with the Edinburgh where you were reaching for torpedoes. Torpedoes can be very strong. Absolutely powerful against cruisers if they hit and in order to get them to hit you have to have something That's going to keep the cruiser locked down usually battleship guns or some kind of gunfire or torpedo threat from a DD Something because otherwise they're just going to move and the Edinburgh was just going to juke the torp So torps were not the choice for the Edinburgh Bombs will have a successful interaction because you can turn so you're going to be able to follow him Go ahead and start the battle so you can get your planes off the deck um, or rockets. Rockets are going to be able to have an interaction with the Edinburgh. And there were a few times where we kept going back to the torps, back to the torps, back to the torps. And I realized that they can be powerful against cruisers, but it's not going to be the best option unless that cruiser is really just stuck. For instance, the Hidden Hindenburg at the end of the match, there was a sub literally in front of the Hindenburg. So he was keeping his nose pointed at the sub so he wasn't showing broadside to it. And you were able to get a bunch of torps into him. So it's using the team positions to facilitate your attack is going to be important. But the rockets are fairly independent in what they can do. Not that they want to strike from any angle, but I mean, you can have an interaction from many angles. And then bombs, of course, are very maneuverable, so they can work, they, they can work well too. Try to save your boost when you make those turns because then you're stuck in a position where <clears throat> DDs are hard to spot. If they turn off their AA, you don't see them, which means you have to slam on the brakes when you're trying to aim. And you need boost to be able to break so that you can aim. So when you're going through this turn here, looking to set up the shot, try not to throw all of your boost away so that you have some on the attack run. At least he's, yeah. he's spotting himself for you, which is nice. Cool, recall. Good. 
Bombs. 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 Ah. Not torps. Bombs. There's nothing for you to torp right now, because those two destroyers are out in the open saying, deal with me. And if you can spot them, you've got a Kiv that's going to be helping, potentially a Johan de Witt that's going to be helping, and then of course you can do damage to them also. Now one of them just did smoke, uh, probably the Akazuki from the position of the smoke, so at this point you might not be able to interact with the DDs. But you can at least give a little love to the Kiv, because if the uh, Parzival camps him, then uh, those two destroyers are going to get free shots into your DD bro. And for all you know, one of the destroyers might not be in smoke. Fighter, fighter, fighter for the dude. Fighter for your DD. Fighter now. Uh oh, he buggered off. What do you mean he buggered off? A Kiev. He just buggered out of the plane with cap. Yeah, he's not in the cap, but there's a Parzival on top of him and the Akazuki is shooting him. <laughs> That's why you wanted the fighter, so that you could try to force the, uh, the Parzival off of him. Uh, this is going to be painful. Use your engine boost. Use your engine boost. I mean, if you're gonna commit to a strike, at least you can try to juke stuff. You're late on starting your attack. Your reticle was too close. You need to put the reticle in front, like... You need... If, if you're striking something bow on, you need to start your attack a little earlier. Because you're often, like, trying to claw back and finish aiming before you get that drop, because you're dropping too close. Make sure that you have the reticle, uh, placed in front of where the target's travel is so that you can meet in the middle because it's not about meeting where he is unless he's literally stationary it's about meeting in the middle yeah. all right so the smoke is going to go down soon you might actually want to start positioning your carrier differently because if those two destroyers yolo right up the mid there's nothing you can do about that autopilot mode enabled you might want to heal. You took flak. Heal. Heal. Whoa, that's really close. It wasn't needed anyway. He was just dead. Well, it is a kill, but he already he uh, he actually dinked one of those torpedoes. He turned in and he he stopped it before it could arm. So that was really close. Uh, you do want to re leave a little bit of wiggle room in case they're going to turn in. Uh, bombs. Oh, sorry. See, I don't know what I'm you're going to... I'm trying gonna... to rock the, rock the DDs. Uh, well, bombs are going to be the most effective against destroyers in terms of damage. I mean, yes, if you can get rockets into the DDs, then that's cool. But you are literally detected, so you need to get the destroyer that's in F5 right now. Which, which is why you probably want bombs for this, because look at the DD. Because you're going to want to be able to force, you know, try to get some kind of real damage interaction here. And you want to put a fighter over that. At least he's going to stop spotting you soon, which is nice. Good shot. Thanks. Fighter airborne. So now you could either torp the FDG or bring bombs. But the rockets aren't going to do you anything right now. So you either need to bring bombs because you could bomb the FTG or a destroyer. Or you bring torps for the FTG and just accept that the destroyer is not going to get hurt. But you may have to re-up your fighter on the smoke screen. Because you do have uh, surf surface assets. A Duke of York, for instance, that could maybe shoot him if he comes out of smoke. So his smoke is going to be up for probably another 30 to 40 seconds. So if you can drop a fighter right about here, right about now, because you're just at around 10 kilometers away from the FDG, which means the fighter will be lit and then unlit, lit and then unlit. So it's not just going to be murdered. And now that the FDG is dead, you shouldn't be seen at all. So the fighter is going to be able to be there. Uh, let's hover the smoke screen, actually. And I'm not a big fan of trying to torp DDs, but at the same time, because you have surface ships that are within torpedo range of the the Wiskavika, Wiskavik, whatever. Uh, because you're, uh, you have ships that are so close, you do want to kind of live on top of this to help them out. And now he is spotted, which is good. So you've got a cruiser that I think takes some shots, a Fiji or something, and a Kiev as well. Smoke should go down very soon. Uh, 
Cool. Good job. So when you, you start th attack, sorry, quick question. When you start attack, does you attacking plane lose less, um, take lose less health due to a kind of buff to the damage they take? Yeah, so with the old way that damage worked, um, you need to start moving your carrier south, maybe to the island at C5. Uh, I don't think you're winning enough that you want to put your carrier in front of the island. I think you want to have your carrier behind the island. Ooh. Heal. Oops, wrong button. So, just drop, just drop. Because there's too much flak going on, because you've got crossfire from one thing shooting to help the other. Um, back in there. Let's look after the back of there. Or the Fiji. Okay, so the old way that AA was distributed was random. So you have nine planes right now. AA would hit one of those nine planes at random. Pew, pew, pew. And the problem is when you'd make your attack, you'd have your three planes going in, and then there was a chance that one of those three planes that was attacking uh, died. In which case your reticle would lurch off to the side, and you'd see an animation of one of the other planes in your squadron coming in and filling up the spot. So, because that was obnoxious, then you had no control over it. Which I accept, there are things out of your control. There's no reason to go that far south. Eh, you're probably fine. You're probably fine. So, because you really didn't have any interaction over that, they there was a damage resilience for the planes that were actually about to shoot. And only those planes. So that if any AA happened to hit them, it was less likely that it caused a kill, so you could go through and attack as normally. And uh, as far as I know, that was just never removed. So the planes that are shooting right now, those three planes, while you're setting up for an attack, they have a damage resistance. But the way that AA works is, it shoots the, uh, it shoots the planes going right to left, and it's the left planes that are the ones that are attacking. So yeah, they have a damage resistance, but if they're not taking damage, who cares? Enemy destroyer so bomber. you only protect these three planes, the ones that you're using right now. So in the case of like a Soviet CV, um, the all of the planes are attacking at once, so all of the planes would have a damage resistance during their attack. In the case of a US CV, it's only the planes that are, you know, the attacking group. The other ones, they're just purely normal. So really, at this point, it's just cleanup, which is nice. You might want to help on the one line. Autopilot mode disabled. Your uh, now is probably gonna die to whatever is over there, whereas mm -hmm. these guys are just gonna get, you know, pummeled. No, okay, cool. So Johan Dewitt helped out your now bro, and then it's just back to farmering. It's always nice when the winds, uh, winds just kind of happen on their own. Uh, I was hoping for a more difficult match since I have you here. <laughs> well, I think we've had some fairly difficult matches. Uh, there was uh, some pretty down-to-the-wire situations. I think we had two games that were like that. Yeah. They may have even been back-to-back. -back. Uh -huh. So, let's take a moment to reflect. Uh, how are you feeling on the Lexington... You know, what are some of the takeaways you've had from this, if any? Granted, before you give me this, I just want to say, you've been a part of my channel for a long time. You sent me a lot of replays. A lot of your CV instincts are not bad. You know how to make attack runs. Your, uh, your rocket placement is actually quite good. You consistently were able to tag DDs over and over. It's not about getting the 12,000 damage shot. It's about getting the hit. And uh, you're consistently getting the hit. Your torping instincts are fine, you get some good damage on that. Your bombing instincts are fine, you get good damage on that. The thing you have to work on is, uh, if you're bombing from the front, you need to start your attack run a little earlier. And I would say there's a little bit of decision making to work on with when are torps going to be the most effective, uh, when are they not. And uh, a little bit of ammo choice, but I wouldn't say that very much.
but I, I want to call all this out because you have a lot of these skills even going into the coaching session. So there's not a lot for me to tell you. I don't need to tell you how to torp. I don't need to tell you how to bomb. I don't need to tell you how to rocket. So really, to me, it's come down mostly to decision making. And I'd just like to ask, you know, from your end, what have you gotten? Has it been useful? Is there anything else I can start to work on or highlight? Is there anything that's still confusing? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for the kind word. Yeah, I have improved a lot since I started watching you and, you know, some replay reviews. And um, like you said, I'm okay with the drops, apart from the bombs, both AP and HE bombs. I think my judgment on how to lead and how to uh, turn turn with the targets that turn need, need to be worked on. And so flag dodging, I think that should be, need to be worked on too. Mm -hmm. And in terms of ammo and the plane choice, I think that is where I am kind of plateaued or stuck, is where to attack and which ship to attack. For example, normally when you were telling me to go after the DDs and the subs, the reason I choose torpedoes is I would just go after the BBs, so which means I might get more damage, but it would be unlikely to win some of those close, uh, close games that we won. So I think that there is what I need to work work on how to how to use a CV to win games. Where can I, you know, exert the maximum pressure with the tools I have? Sure. I think that is the next big hurdle, which I you make it look easy, unfortunately, when you play it. But when you actually there, you recall and you choose a plane, it's sometimes difficult. My split second decisions: okay, which plane, which target, sure. and then at what time. The best thing I can tell you is. Uh, you're going to lift off with some planes and you have 30 to 40 seconds to just kind of watch what's going on while you're going from point A to point B. Um, I stopped looking at the planes a long time ago. I mean, they just sit there, so... Uh, so I'm spending most of the time looking at the mini-map and I usually have an idea of what the next thing I want to work on is while I'm making an attack on something. Sometimes I don't have that idea, and I just have to sit there and stare blankly at the map after I recall, going, what am I going after? Um, and usually I'll, I'll come up with something. Um, I just want, as far as the target choice, I, me personally, I work on a priority structure. You know, this is more important than this, is more important than this, is more important than that. And you're not going to go wrong. If you're looking at what's on the map and you're thinking, hmm, that looks like a problem. Can I help there? If there's a destroyer having a brawl with your destroyer, yeah, you can help. If you have if you have uh, some battleships and your destroyer is dead or your destroyer has left them out in the middle of nowhere, you can help. You can be the person that kind of guides them out of the storm or tries to get them you know, back engaged again because battleships that don't have a front line play really scared and tend to just sail away from the enemy. And that doesn't help you, that doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help them have fun, doesn't help you win the game. It's just no fun. But it's gonna be, you, you have to look at, one, where can you help? And two, you wanna look at, where can I have an interaction with an enemy that my team can also shoot? Because there were a few times where your instincts were guiding you toward, eh, I'll, I'll deal with this thing. Eh, I'll deal with this thing. And I'm, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes the options are extremely hard. Like the first game that we had, you struck the Petro. You got him to back off. Great. But then the Petro merged up with two battleships, so you don't really have anything that you can do there. And there wasn't really any targets to go for, and everything was high tier and had big a or strong AA. So there were just a whole lot of no options, which sucked. But that's going to happen sometimes. If the enemy's job is not to give you uh, a target-rich environment, the enemy's job is to deny you a target-rich environment. And that is exactly what they did. And not only did they do that, they did it while killing your teammates. So it was even, it was doubly worse. But usually there's some, there's some way in or there's something that you can interact with. Either trying to hold the front line or harry, uh, harry down people that your team is able to work on. Because as awkward as it sounds, kill, like CVs, you have two kills in this one. You had three kills in another one, I think. It's You'll get kills in a carrier, but it's so often not you that kills the ship entirely by yourself. It's usually you that does like 15 or 20% of its health pool because the other 80% got ripped out by somebody else. So you have to plan your interactions around 
how is my target also being shot by my team? And if the answer is, well, my target isn't being shot by my team, well, then you're probably wasting your time striking it. It's just the reality of the situation. Unless you are over-tiered, or you are in a situation where you can do an extreme amount of damage, like if you're on a Hakuryu, for instance, and you find an isolated battleship with bad AA, you could torp the ever-living shit out of it, and he's, it's going to leave a mark. Let's do something real quick. Let's go back to the port, and let's go into a training room so we can work on the curling. Alright, so go ahead and take the Lexington. Uh, Create battle. If you're on ocean, I want you to change the battle mode to um, the bottom one, I think it is. It's the armor resilience test, yeah. And let's set the battle time to 30 minutes just so you got time. We're not going to use that, but create. You don't even have to set up enemies here. Uh, so I just want you to ready up and then battle because it'll be the Lexington. Oh, that's it. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's start. So we're going to work on curling. Uh, because this is going to be a pretty critical skill for U.S. battleships. Or sorry, U.S. carriers. Um, so right now, throw your carrier into full forward and hard right rudder. So that's W three times and then E uh, twice. Or four times, I guess, sorry. So yeah, so you're... Your carrier is going to spin in a circle on its own, so you don't even have to worry about it, and you can uh, lift off with your bombs. Now, before, we're not going to strike the carrier straight off, we're just going to talk about approaches. So I want you to fly forward, and then I want you to approach your carrier from the front. Cool. So we know the carrier is going to move forward. Maybe if you're attacking a ship, you're going to know the same. Put the reticle where you expect to hit the carrier which is now. So even now, if you slam on the brakes, you're still, you're still not quite firmed up by the time you get on the carrier, but you're kind of firmed up. So you actually want that reticle to be even, even further away from the carrier, like an entire ship length away. You're putting it about half a ship length. So let's look at where that reticle right there was. That reticle right there was a full ship length in front of the CV. And yet, when you attack from the front, it's only half a ship length. So, your reticle placement from behind is beautiful. The reticle placement from the front is not. Now, when curling, you're going to put the reticle off to the side, opposite of the way you're going to turn in. So, and that was too close, because you could see half the reticle was on the ship when you did that, and you can see how hard it is to firm all this up, right? Yep. So... That's, that's your thing. Let's go from the front again. You place the reticle uh, before the enemy ship. Well, in this case, the friendly ship, because it's you. But... Now. So did you see, like, the reticle almost wasn't even touching the ship, and now we're firmed up, and we're going in and taking the shot? That's about how far you're going to be doing it. Because the dive bombers, yes, they have an up and down motion, but these are not AP dive bombers, so it's okay for you to be able to roll into your target or roll onto your target. Okay, so can do one more from the front, and then we're going to look at curling. So when you're curling, I want you to think about, you know, a clock. You know, the old circle ones, not the digital ones. In which case, you know, if you put the reticle at 3 o'clock, you can roll it up to noon or something. You can roll it up to 12 o'clock. So we don't want to put the reticle, if, if you're looking at that clock face, you want to have the room to be able to roll it from 3 o'clock to 12 o'clock. If you put the reticle at like 1, that's not going to give you a lot of room to work with. So you want the room, you want the ability to make the turn. So in this case, to roll, yeah, you'd come in from the left. And you turned in a little early there. You wanted to actually just kind of let the planes move forward on their own so you could hook in a little bit later. Okay. 
But effectively, this is what a battleship's gonna do. Oh no, there's planes! And then they're gonna slide into a turn, and this is that turn. So it's recognizing how to place your reticle in relation to it. So you can spend time in a training room, just having your CV spin in a circle, and you practice doing attack runs on it. Don't turn in yet, don't turn in yet, don't turn in, now turn in. Okay, so let it linger just a little bit longer to pull yourself off to the left so you can hook in a little bit later in the turn. Uh, sometimes that can screw you, where it's gone on so long that you don't have time to turn in anymore, but it's going to be a feel thing, you're going to learn it. If you start to turn in early, you're just denying yourself the ability to turn into the shot. We're turning in a little early, so we don't have quite the line we're looking for. Also, I'm using the A and D key while turning, which I need to, you know, stop doing it. It's just jerks, jerky. Yeah, so, before, right now, I want you to look forward with the mouse, and then mm -hmm. I want you to start pulling the mouse off to the, to the right, or to the left, that's fine. Don't jerk it, though. Just move it slow and watch as the console re or the, the thing responds. Move it a little more. Move it a little more. Move it a little more. You can hard turn with the mouse. But if you have to do a hard turn, like a real hard turn, use the keyboard. But once you start getting it to the point where you can fine tune it, that's when the mouse needs to take over. Because, yeah, the keyboard is extremely jerky. Yeah. This is a keyboard. Well, it's not just a problem with the keyboard, it's the problem that the keyboard is going to fight with the mouse. Because the mouse is trying to give input at the same time as the keyboard is. So as soon as you let up on the keyboard key, it's going to start moving back toward wherever your reticle is pointed. So it's better, if you can, to guide in with the mouse. Yeah, maybe two, right. Yeah, see, this right here is not, you're not using the mouse at all. That's just completely trying to keyboard it, and it gets awkward. Try not to use your keyboard at all. Once you set the thing, I mean, that wasn't a hard turn there. You could just use your mouse for the entire drop. Okay, not touching the keyboard at all. Well, yeah. you need to get yourself on a line, <laughs> so... Yeah. Once you've started your drop. Now, put it further off to the left. Further off to the left, because you're going to have to hook in pretty severely here. There you go, start your attack. Just use your mouse, but you can't you can't yank it over to the side. You have to guide it over. Yeah. When you quickly <laughs> lurch it over like thirty degrees, that breaks the that breaks the aiming contact. Basically, it's it's assuming that if you're gonna quickly look over to your right or look over to your left, that's the equivalent of a free look. You're just trying to glance and see what's going on. When you're trying to aim, you're more steady with your mouse movement. So you want to you want to guide it into a turn and keep the turn going. <clears throat> Further to the left, you're too close. Because we're not going to be able to cut in enough. You need the room yeah. to be able to cut in. Yeah, I see what I need to do now. I can just practice, basically. Yeah, I see what I need to do. So, I want you to think of the Lexington as though it's like, it's at 1 o'clock on a, on a clock face, and you're going to put your reticle at 10 o'clock on a clock face. So, you need to place it at a pretty decent, you know, spacing, because yeah. right now, this is 11 o'clock. That's 11 o'clock, that's not far enough to the left. And it's also a little too close. <clears throat> So just mentally imagine a clock right now. Pretend the Lexington's going to be 1, and you're going to put the reticle at around 10. And also, because planes move forward, you know, it's not strictly like a clock face. You're going to pull it a little closer to you, per se. Start the attack. And you turned the mouse a little quick there, so it didn't know how to follow, but it could have been, that could have been really good. 
Yeah, let's see what you mean. Just need to uh, anticipate more. But it was really good reticle placement. Yeah, thank you. So you just, yeah, so. And to one internal clock face and don't jerk the mouse all the way to this side. So in the future, instead of riding on the outside, let's cut on the inside of the turn just so we can set up for the next drop a little faster. So right about there. Good. And guide it in with the mouse. Good. It's a great line. That's a beautiful line. Cut to the left. Might be easier to take off another flight. Well, I mean, you can do that too. That's obviously a choice. Uh, Attack. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. Try to make the angles a little more aggressive. Try to make the curl a little more aggressive. Come in at a sharper angle. So instead of the uh, carrier being at 1 o'clock, how about we put it at 2 o'clock? Which means reticle wise, you know, it's going to be 10 30, 11 o'clock. But let's try to make that carrier at a sharper angle. About here. But it's not bad that your instincts are pulling you onto a good line. Sometimes it's tough to tell somebody to do the wrong thing. But uh, we do so want to practice what it looks like for a sharper, harder turn. And in the sharper, harder turns, you may actually want to, uh, you may want to use the keyboard a little until you can guide from the mouse. So try to approach where, like from here, where it's already in an angle. So slow down to let it turn a little more. Slow down to let it turn a little more. Because there's, it's a pretty shallow angle right now. You're getting ahead of it. That might be something that I'd have to show you, because I don't know if I'm describing it very well. Alright, so the reticle was a little bit too far out there. So just hard turn and point almost directly at the carrier. Because we're trying to make this harder for you. At the carrier, at the carrier, at the carrier. Now, pull the reticle off to the left and make the turn. Slam on the brakes because you're really close. A little too far. Need to work on the placement, but that's the strike I want you to work on. I want you to work on it being a little sharper turn. Because this is going to happen. You're going to have enemies that don't want to get shot, or don't want to get bombed. So you're going to have people that break and make hard turns like this. And you need to be able to read that to try to be able to cut in. Also, you want to save some boosts so that you can slow down during the turns if you have to, so you can make adjustments. So let's go straight at the carrier right now. Straight at the carrier. Don't lead it, just go straight at the carrier, and then as you get close, you're going to put the reticle off to the side so you can curl in. Off to the side. Good. Start the attack. Slam on the brakes. Curl in. A little too sharp on the curl, but it's okay. You rescued it. You could have like used the keyboard for about halfway and then guided it in with the mouse. So fly directly at the carrier. And offset a little. That's good. That's a little too far forward actually. You yeah. overshot. So you're still leading the target, which is okay, but the practice is, is trying to learn how to cut. 
So is learning how to turn in. A little too far, you're actually overleading. So when you started your attack there, your planes were almost like directly in front of the carrier. So all you were doing is kind of like over, over passing it basically. Um, you want, if there's space between your planes and your reticle, if there's a space on the map, you know, on the board or whatever, you want the nose of the carrier to be pointing in between your planes and the reticle. If the carrier's nose is pointing at your planes, you're already a little too far. So, oh. if that gives you kind of a mental image. So, at the carrier. Because ultimately, you can do a fifth, you can do a 90 degree drop with these planes. Good, start. There we go, that's beautiful. Guide it in. Too hard with the keyboard, use the mouse. Okay. So once you kind of, you've started your turn and you kind of got a feel for it, then you can guide it in with the mouse. You cut in a little too hard, a little too early, and you weren't able to completely guide it onto the deck. Let's go directly at the Lexington. Save your boost for the attack. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good. Don't hard turn in too much. Let it... You gotta let it... You have to let it hook. You gotta let the planes move forward a little past the nose of the carrier so you can hook into it because you can see he's still turning. So, you can't start the attack while your planes are directly where the carrier's nose is pointed because that's just too far. But during the course of your attack, you want the planes to pass the nose of the carrier, or at least the direction the carrier's pointed, for you to hook in because he's still turning. The carrier's still turning, and uh, you're going to meet in the middle. So, there you go. Now you've just... Well, okay. So you almost passed his nose, and then you rescued it, and that's cool. So, good. You were just about to turn in too quick again. And, whoop, whoop, and then you recovered it, and you kind of got onto the, you know... Instead of being on the port side, you were on the starboard side of the carrier briefly until you all merged up straight again. Bit if, tricky this one, but if you sure really, I'll get it. Oh yeah, I mean it comes in time, right? It comes with practice, it comes with repetitions. It's a feel thing. But your reticle placement is already much better. Your attack angles are much more consistent. That's a beautiful drop. That's bam. That's dead six uh, six bomb hits there. So if you can do it one more time, and then we'll try to approach this a, a different way and curl from uh, cur curl from behind because it's going to be a different strike. That's way too late. Slam on the brakes, slam on the brakes. You're super close. Yeah, so you're kind of able to recover it because the carrier's a big target, but that was, uh, that reticle placement was too late. Yeah. Try one more time. Don't hard turn too much. Remember, port to starboard side. You have to cross. You got to go from one side to the other, and you were, you did not do that. You turned in too sharp. Morning, Bisco. Because ideally, if you're coming in dead on from the front, you know you're dancing in port side AA, dancing in starboard side AA. You're just you're right on that edge, and in that attack run, you were always on the port. So you were not coming in from the front, you were always on the port side. Cool, so you went from port to starboard, and you're swinging back in. Cool, yeehaw. I think you uh, turned with the mouse enough that it broke, 
that it broke its aiming, so it wasn't uh, continuing to pull. So you're like, what? <laughs> uh, but you did <laughs> rescue it, which is nice. All right, so let's start working on attacks from behind. So I want you to start coming in. You're, you're coming in for the strike. The thing is moving off, so you need to read this. You need to put the reticle off to the side. Now, you're going to have to put the reticle a little in front. No, 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 because this is not going to help you turn. That's just going to cross it like an X. Yeah, there's no way that you can make that happen because he's turning off to the right. So if you're curling, you're going to place the reticle on the opposite side of the ship that you're looking to turn in on. So if he's turning to the right, you're going to put the reticle on the left so that you can turn in. So in this case, if the Lexington is, say, noon, you're going to put the reticle at 10 o'clock off on the left so that you can ride forward and curl in. There you go. That's a little too late now. You've kind of overtaken the carrier. But that's the idea. So let's refine that. So you can see where he is, you kind of read the turn, you're just going to have to put the reticle enough off that you're going to be able to stay latched in on behind, cool. Now you didn't have the reticle in front of the ship, which meant you were chasing, but it still worked out because there is still forward movement on the drop. So as you were going through the drop pattern, you were still able to come in and make, you know, firm the reticle to catch a good line, which is good. So do it again, but try to have the reticle if not at the same, like, uh, like there. Oh man, well, it was just a hair after I would have done it, but uh, you want it not right next to this, or, oh God, how do I describe this, damn it. <laughs> if you have two people on, uh, two people in the Olympics and they're doing the running thing, right? They're staggered, right? They're not right next to each other in a line. You know, one of them's kind of in front of the next, one of them's kind of a little more in front, one of them's kind of a little more in front. You almost want to have that staggered runner off to the left side of this carrier, where it's a little bit in front of the carrier, if you were thinking of it like that. There we go. Because now as you're aiming, you're riding parallel and you're able to cut in. But we need to work on how you find your line. <clears throat> so in terms of reticle placement, you're not doing it like adjacent, which is like next to the carrier. Oh my god, how do I describe far off? <laughs> okay, recall real well, you can keep playing around. But alright, recall, stay, stay. Just give me a moment so we can kind of talk about this. Alright. So the carrier is turning. You're pursuing the carrier. If you think of it in terms of a clock face, we're gonna use the clock example a lot here. If the carrier right now is is at 12 o'clock and you put your reticle at eleven, well, in terms of the in terms of the clock, right? They're next to each other. They're they're the same distance away from the center of the clock, right? Because that's how clocks work. That's how the arms work. So, if twelve o'clock decided to start moving away from the center of the clock, then by the time that the hand moved from eleven to twelve, twelve would already be forward and away from it. I know that's a weird example, but I'm trying to give a mental picture. <laughs> So you would almost, in this case, if you know that uh, if you know that that 12 o'clock position is moving away from the center, then you have to put your reticle further away from the center to be able to meet in the middle, right? So when you bomb from the front, you put the reticle in front of the target between you and it because it's moving toward you, you're moving toward it, you meet in the middle, right? Yep. Well, when you're attacking from behind, you want the reticle to be just a little bit ahead of the enemy ship so that when you're finished aiming, you guys are meeting in the middle again. But the challenge here is you also have to be able to catch the line where, yes, the reticle is ahead of the enemy ship's position, but you're still going to be able to curl in and catch him in the middle of his turn, which is awkward and it's hard to describe, but... Try it again. <laughs> there we go. 
There we go. So it's just a little bit in front. It's not huge because there's a lot of forward movement with the planes. Now in this case, it was close enough to the to the target that we weren't having that going from part uh, going from starboard over to port and then back in on that perfect perfectly aligned kind of thing because we still want the planes to slightly pass the the middle axis of the ship. We wanted to go from starboard to port and then just basically into the drop. So that's a great reticle placement. And we're curling in. You very nice. Very nice. I was a little worried you're going to cut in uh turn in a little more sharply and deny yourself the angle, but uh you did recover that. So woot. Try it again, and then, as you start to get the feel of it, try to make it a more aggressive angle. Instead of attacking something that's at a 15 degree off angle, start making it a 20, start making it a 25, start making it a 30. Cool. A little far forward, but uh, you did catch a good line. And knowing that you caught a good line is important. Here you go. He's gonna merge up, and you have a drop. So, ideally, let's let's assume that you're trying to bomb a destroyer. Well, the destroyer is not as large as the CV. So if you can, let's try to get the target reticle dead center in the CV. Not on the nose of the ship, not on the ass of the ship, but dead center. So that you're, you're trying to correctly place where the reticle's gonna go. So you had an interaction over the center a little bit, in which case you might have overshot the DD a bit there. So we're pretending the center of the carrier, that's the bullseye, that's what you want to merge up on. Cut in a little early, starboard to port. But you do get the interaction there, which is nice. It's a little off axis, but uh, you did get the get the fully aimed reticle over the center of the ship, so you could have made a shot there. If we're assuming that's the bullseye, which we are. Cousin too early. Well, it's all about reticle placement because where you place the reticle is where you're going to have to recover the shot from because you are deliberately putting the reticle in the wrong spot so that you can pull it on to the correct spot. So if the reticle is too far forward, then it's even harder to make that happen. If it's too far back, it's even harder to make that happen. So you mentally kind of plan out where you're off aiming the shot so that you can correctly aim the shot, which is interesting. Mm. So a little off axis there too. So you're getting the reticle consistently onto the center of the Lexington now, which is good. This is improvement. But you want to get that up, down, you want, you want to get that perfect line. But this is what's going to happen with muscle memory. This is something that's going to be practiced over, you know, time after time after time. And you're going to start to be able to make it happen repeatedly. But it's going to take literally, you know, hundreds of drops. Now, this is only for the U.S. line. The other bombers don't really work this way. Uh, there's a bit of a similar interaction with German bombers, kind of. Uh, there's a rolling interaction like this for the Japanese planes, but yeah, that's it's still it's a different vibe. But you can do literally a similar thing where you just have your carrier, you know, spin in a circle in a training room so you can figure out how to make the approaches.
Okay, so now we're actually going to uh, start bombing the carrier. I want you to actually start dropping bombs, and I want you to hit the bombs on the center of the carrier. So you're not going to live very long. That's okay. Yeah, too far forward. Well, it's not that bad because you are leading your target. So you got four out of six bombs in the center of the carrier. That was a little too far off to the side. So, when you're recovering the drop, you can recover. You can always slam on the brakes and you can take more time and you can try to figure it out so that you can get the hit. That's certainly a thing that you can do. But the longer that you're taking recovering the drop is the longer that you're spending in AA, the more time you're spending in boost, you know, the more resources you're burning up. So ideally, you know, every drop is perfect. And you're getting the most out of it. Ooh, that's an overturn with the keyboard. That was really rough. What What's going on there? Definitely the keyboard mouse to turn at the same time. It's a bit... Uh... Yeah, just remember, easy movements with the mouse. The mouse... The planes will respond to the movement of the mouse. You just can't jerk it. Because if you start doing that, it doesn't know if you're trying to aim or if you're trying to quick look at something. Several bomb center. So there's not a way in a training room to tell a uh, to tell a DD to do what you want it to do. There just isn't. Uh, you could set a few bot AI things, have them armed and have them moving, and they'll charge your carrier and shoot you a bunch. So you could do that. But in terms of like curling, uh, let's exit to port and let's start working on stationary targets. So over on the enemy team. You can go ahead and ready up in the Lexington, but over on the enemy team, let's put a bunch of battleships. Whatever nation you choose, not armed, not moving. It wouldn't matter if it's moving because it wouldn't do anything if it can't shoot, so I don't think it moves regardless. Oh, sorry, moving or not moving? Well, not moving ideally, but who knows? If it moves, that might be cool. I just don't think it will oh. if it's not armed. So, whatever. Just add a bunch of them and start up. Be funny if they end up ramming you. But. Okay, so. You've seen what it's like to try to curl after something that's moving. Now, one of the things that I'll frequently do when I'm playing a destroyer is try to give an idea to an enemy carrier that wants to bomb me that I'm moving on a line so that he's going to place his reticle so he can curl on top of me. And then I slam, I cut the throttle or I, ta I change my turn or something, which denies him the room to be able to curl in on top of me. So he'll overshoot or he'll under aim or he'll have a bad line, something like that. And as we see what the curling looks like, we know we can know what that means from a DD's perspective. But you are going to occasionally be bombing stuff that's not moving uh, or is extremely slow. And it's worth feeling out how hard you can turn in the planes. See, I don't think they're going to move, so it doesn't matter. Um, let's start working on a 90 degree drop. So I want you to take a bad line, which is hard because you, your body's going to want to guide you to do the right thing. Like you're already looking at a Veneto like you want to strike it. But I want you to come in at a 90 degree angle on a battleship and try to recover it. So think of it in terms of the clock face. The battleship's going to be at like 3 o'clock. Your reticle's going to be at like 12. But remember that bombs are still moving forward. So you have to you have to uh, put the reticle a little closer to the center of the clock. As, as I was using the example earlier. Because they're going to travel. And because they're going to travel you have to account for that movement. Overturned again with the keyboard. You gotta you gotta chill on the keyboard Find out how to make the mouse do the work Think of the keyboard as like an emergency, you know break glass in tight in case of uh, fire
You're turning in a little, a little too quick. Slow it down, slow it down. Yeah, so you want, when you're placing that reticle, you're expecting the planes to roll forward. So you are placing the reticle pulled in a little bit because the planes are gonna move forward, you have to let them move forward. You can't just immediately turn. You kinda wanna let them firm and then turn. There we go, that's nice. Now you slammed on the brakes there, which is gonna help you turn sharper. See what you can do without having to slam on the brakes. See what you can do uh, in terms of letting the planes move. Now in this case, you'd have to speed up because you're going to run out of time. <laughs> and that can happen if you take a shot and then the enemy starts pulling forward, like a destroyer or even a battleship, depending on how quickly it accelerates. So this is going to be too far away. You're going to have to accelerate to get on target. So yes, you're giving yourself room to roll, but uh, at the same time, you got to think of it in terms of that clock face. You know, when you're setting the reticle, it's got to be close enough. Ooh, -hoo. that's going to be tough. Uh, okay. <laughs> that reticle was really close to the ship. <laughs> that's really close, but maybe you can, yeah, you can recover that if you slam on the brakes. It was a little too much on the keyboard, and it was a little too early. You could have made it happen, but it was you started turning in too early. Try to uh, try to play chicken with yourself. Try to dare yourself to turn in later, so that you can feel what it's like. So I I went out on a, a company. You know, we were celebrating our company's anniversary or whatever, and we went out to to be in some go karts. And I asked, you know, is it okay if we spin out? And the go-kart instructor told me, uh, if you don't spin out, then you're not trying to learn the limits of your go-kart. So it's perfectly okay to spin out. Because you need to learn what you can and cannot do. Because that's the only way you know how to push it to the highest level of performance. So don't just turn in because you're scared you're going to miss it. Try to dare yourself to turn in later. And figure out when you have to turn in so that you get it. So that's too early again. And again, I know you're using the keyboard because the mouse is not looking where the planes are going. It's just sharply turning off to the left. Use the mouse. Now, your mouse is so hard turned here that it delatched because you just immediately looked off to the left. So here, stop dropping. Look forward. Look forward with your mouse. Look a little to the left. It pulled in. Look a little to the left a little more. Notice it broke. When you hit that 25 degree mark, it's gonna stop going. But if you coax it into the left, it's gonna respond, oh, you wanna turn? And you can see how sharply they turn. I'm telling you, you can make these turns with the mouse. You just can't <laughs> jerk it over. Calm, steady, allow yourself to make the movement. If you have to hard turn during the initial part of the drop, that's okay, but you need to keep your mouse pointed where you want to go, so that when you lay off of the keyboard, the mouse takes over. Good. So ideally you turn in a little sharper, a little later, and you roll directly onto the center of the ship. Use the mouse. Use the mouse, Luke. Cool. That was like a 20 degree offset. Let's try to aim for that 60, 70, 80, 90 degree uh, turn. With the one that's going to be really just obnoxiously stupid. So a little close to the ship, so you're going to have to give it room to breathe. And now you hard turn, hard turn, hard turn, hard turn, hard turn. And try to call it in. But uh, your reticle was really close to the ship. It was really tight, so you had to give it a lot of room to breathe. But you also see how much you can pull it back when it's not in the right spot. You have a lot of maneuverability on these planes. Again with the keyboard overturn. Okay, cool. So you tried to keyboard and then go to the mouse. Good. 
but you weren't following the movement with the mouse. So as soon as you let off the keyboard, the planes are like, what? And they started going back to where the mouse was pointed because as soon as you're not using the keyboard, the mouse takes over. So you need to work together. You need to keep, keep your eyes on the prize. Where are you looking to go? Good. Challenge yourself to do 60 degree drops, 70 degree drops, 90 degree drops. You got the 30 degrees down. 30 degrees you were practicing on your carrier when it was spinning. Okay, so we're hard turning cool. We need to go to the mouse. Okay, almost got it. Almost recovered it. Keep working on the 90. I'm telling you, you're going to be able to find it. Or you could even go to 120 degree, which like that right there was a 100 degree turn. Oh, that's looking nice. You need to speed up so you get the reticle on the ship. So that was a 100 degree turn. That's more than a 90 degree turn. You can do this. Use keyboard for hard turns and mouse for small adjustments? Yes. So when you use the keyboard, the keyboard left and right is telling the planes left or right. It, there's no room for subtlety. There is hard left or not left at all. There is no middle ground for the keyboard. However, the mouse is gonna give you a lot of subtle movement that you're gonna use when trying to aim. So you have basically rough aim and fine aim, and you're gonna be using your fine aim to guide in on specific targets when using rock rockets and using torpedoes and using bombs etc so it's perfectly fine to use a combination of the two when you know you need to hard aim sure use the keyboard completely okay but you have to have your mouse looking at your target so that as soon as you stop using the keyboard the mouse takes over and you can fine aim if you instead just land on the keyboard and you don't actually adjust where you're looking at on the screen well then basically the game gets confused. As soon as you stop using the keyboard, it goes, well, the mouse is over there, and it starts look, trying to go back to where the mouse is. And you'll find that uh, some newer players, while they're learning CV, will have a lot of problems with the keyboard and the mouse fighting for who has control. And the keyboard always wins. If you touch the keyboard, it's the thing that's going to get the control. But when the mouse is looking slightly off to the left, and you like keyboard aim onto it, but then it pulls off. But then you keyboard back on and then it pulls off. It's because of uh, they're fighting each other. So if you ever have a choice, always aim with the mouse. But the keyboard is there as a backup to make sure that if you need to hard turn, you can tell it hard turn. That's too far away. You'd have to accelerate. I don't think you make that. Reticle was too early. You needed to let it push out a little more. Because you see, you'd have a great roll if you were just a little further forward to be able to roll onto the ship. Just a little too early. So about... Yeah. Yep. Nice. Hard turn, hard turn, hard turn. Get your mouse looking at your target. Get your mouse looking at your target. Ooh. Almost. Yeah, so you got that little, you see that little dot in the very center of the screen? Yep. That's where your mouse is looking. So you didn't have your mouse on the Veneto. You had it looking at the water off on the side of the Veneto. So as soon as you let go of the keyboard, your mouse is not going to be helping you. You want your mouse to be telling the, telling where the shot is going. So good. You had much, you had a lot of control as to where the center of the screen was pointing there, which is what you want. I like that. Guide it in. Stop with the keyboard. Use the mouse. Use the mouse, Luke. See? We overturn with the keyboard. The mouse isn't in position to correct it. You can't correct it. Shit. 
Well, then you start dancing around hitting the, the left hard mouse move, or how hard key on the keyboard. It's like it, it just it slips away from you. It's fine to hard turn, but you need to hard turn into the fine aiming. Can I tell you something? Sure. I prefer torpedoes on the Japanese planes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> But I understand this is um, very important, especially when you go to Midway and have to deal with um, DDs. Well, yeah, the US bombers are like... So your rockets are really fast, which is cool. They have good pens, so I mean they're consistent, but they're not amazing. They're not the things that just rip stuff apart. The torpedoes are really strong. Absolutely, it's a solid, uh, a solid weapon for the US. But the bombs are its specialty. It's the thing that it has that nobody else does. Other people have torpedoes, other people have rockets, but nobody has bombs that work like this that can really rip into stuff. So learning how to use the bombs is going to be a critical part of learning how to make the US CV line really jump out. Because it's just, this is part of what you do. The fact that you could strike a battleship from almost any angle and be able to assure most, if not all, of your payload is going to have a hit that's going to roll into damage, it's going to roll into fire chance, it's going to roll into a second attack. You might actually burn a damage con early because you get maybe not one fire, maybe you get two. And then the second strike is going to give you perma fires. It's, there's so much potential in the bombers that you have to practice how to make sure that the bombs are going to hit. Okay, so let's go, let's back out and we're going to look at DDs. And this, I don't think you really have a problem here, but we're going to do this just for informational purposes, because we're working on bombs. So you don't have to get rid of the Venetos if you don't want to, just add DDs. Because removing them takes a while, so it's kind of obnoxious. Cool. I don't know if they move if they see your ship, or if they only move if they can do something threatening. Like, the Skeins may actually see the Lexington from the spawn, in which case maybe they'll move, but I don't know what they would do. If you set it to move and attack, then at least there's like, there's a behavior where they'll just charge your ship while firing. Uh, but I'm assuming that they're not going to move. <clears throat> So, worth knowing also, for the US line, the way that the bombs work, initially the bombs all fell toward the center of the reticle. However, they found that you could just murder face destroyers, so that was no good. So, knowing that, they altered it so that the bombs fall on the outside of the reticle, but they disperse inward. Now, some people have said that this means that two of the six bombs will drop in the kind of the centerish of the reticle, and then four of the six bombs will drop on the outer half of the reticle. In which case, are they moving? Hey, they're actually moving. Cool. Well, bomb some DDs. Um, <clears throat> so you can use your curling technique to try to make the best strikes possible. And if you're going to strike with the center of the reticle, then theoretically you might hit with two bombs. If you strike with the outside of the reticle, you might strike with more simply because there's four bombs, but there's more area for the, the four bombs to be dispersed across. Therefore, you might hit, but at the same time, you might completely miss two. In the end, the bombs are going to go wherever they go. You don't have control over that. That was way too early. Um, you don't have control over the RNG. The best you do is put the reticle on the target and you hope that there's an interaction. Because that's all you can do. That's an overshot. Yeah, not able to aim either. So that's one thing that you can use as a destroyer if you're being bombed, is if you have an angle between you and the CV, if the CV is good, they're going to try to curl on top of you. But then if all of a sudden you slam on the brakes, you deny them the range, the distance to be able to firm up their accuracy and curl in on top of you. So then they start making those uh, shots with a giant reticle and the bombs go wherever the hell they go. Cool. So 
So when your bombs hit, the reticle was completely on top of the DD, which is the best you can do. Also to be aware, when you've got more maneuverable targets, like destroyers, they might S-turn. So you start going in for the turn, but they cut in the other way. So it forces you to have a weird line. Uh, so be aware of the fact that they can S-turn. And when you're going against battleships, you could absolutely put the reticle way off to the side and try to hook in and make it happen. Because the rudder on a battleship is just not amazing. But when you start going against highly maneuverable cruisers, or pretty much most any DD because they're very maneuverable, they have the possibility of doing S-turns, wiggles, back forths, turning to the left, turning to the right, and it can throw your aim off. So you do have to kind of mentally prepare for that. He's going to S-turn, so read the S-turn. If he's cutting off to the left, you want to move the reticle a little to the right so you can hook on. So how do you deal with an S-turn? Because we saw that you approached the destroyer and you were a little off to the left or whatever, and then he cut in and it kind of foiled your aim. If you see what looks like an S-turn, you're actually going to put the reticle almost on top of the DD, and then try to read what they're doing. If they're cutting to the one side, you put the reticle on the other so you can hook in. If they start to alter, you try to recover. You want to read the movement as best as possible, and there's not a really... It's down to the skill of the player as to how well they're able to confuse you in terms of where to put your reticle and how to make the drop. But um, it's still something that you have to expect, certainly against a destroyer. Some DDs are just going to hard turn. That's all they're going to do. They're just going to turn to one direction and say, please don't hit me. I, you know, God, give me the strength to just dodge. You know, stuff like that. But, realistically, you need to, as a carrier player, expect that, uh, expect that the Jukes are going to come. They could slow down, they could speed up, they could turn left, they could break out of the turn. You need to be at least prepared for that. <laughs> Tried to recover it. No, so the one wasn't moving, so now it's not a worthy target. It doesn't move. Oh, is he beneath you? Well, literally, because you're flying over him, but <laughs> make it two there. No. All right, so these are things that you can practice in a training room on your own. Trying to hook in on your own carrier, trying to work on battleships and stuff. These are things that you have the opportunity to make happen. And if the destroyers are just running around in a circle randomly, then theoretically, if you moved your CV forward, the uh, battleships might do the same. So... You, you can make a training room and you can do this practice on your own as you want. But uh, since we kind of talked about curling because that was an issue that needed to be addressed, uh, why don't we go ahead and do another random battle so that we can kind of see the results, see if there's any uh, fruit from our efforts. By the way, Blue Devil, thank you for the prime. Ah, uh, come on, give me DDs. I need four or five DDs. Ah, uh, three will do. Hey, top tier for once. Uh, should be all right. I was hoping for European DDs with no smokes, but uh, what can you do? You do the best you can, Light Wraith. Okay, so... 
Uh, got super pixelated. Can you close your stream and reopen it? Huh? In Discord. Okay. Sometimes just closing it and reopening it kind of allows it to refresh. Thank you. Is it better? Uh, it helped for a few seconds. <laughs> it, there's only so much you can do with Discord, so he's okay. You've got an information fighter down, which is good. You happen to see one of the DDs. Don't worry about striking the Lo Yang. You still have. You still need to get information. Well, it's too late now. Now. You had the option of turning left or turning right. If you turn to the left, you go further away from uh, Battleship and Cruiser AA. Turning to the right, however, gives you a shot on the Emerald, so that's nice. I assumed you wanted to strike the DD twice. Let's actually go with bombs. So, you've already used rockets once, you just lost a few. So let's start to get a second resource in place so we can get regenning. You have an interaction there. Uh, that was a bad shot by the Implacable. That was weird. He might try to go for a CV snipe, but uh, his attempt there was not great. Cruise control. Don't just throw away your boost. Gotcha. Uh, should I go up a little yet? With the bombs? Yeah, force him to smoke. Absolutely. If you can scare him into smoking, that's a resource he doesn't have to kill your friends. Right? There's already a smoke screen off where the Tallinn is. So it looks like the Gaide or whatever is off on the two line. Lo Yang is absolutely scary and is about to hydro and kill your Oland, which he just did. So, yeah, definitely if we could have had, well, I mean, your Oland should have had a clue, but unfortunately he didn't, so. Good, nice hit, do it again. Force him to smoke, or kill him. Killing him is good too. And don't forget that you can start your turn as the bombs are dropping. So blind drop and set the uh, set the fighter. He's got his AA off, so as long as he doesn't turn it on, the fighter keeps him penned. All right, so there's a there's a guy day that's off on the one line, and you don't have a DD that's working on that, so you might need to work on the guy day. You do have an Anchin, but he's in a smoke screen, not doing anything really close to his ship, probably waiting to get killed by the Talin. So. Unfortunately, it sucks as a carrier to have to go after destroyers. Oh, and you're in Torps, which means you can't do anything to him. So that's... Never yeah, mind. So looking at, looking at Bismarck. Yeah, but... Okay. But let's ask ourselves, what does is, what is shooting the Bismarck do here? Do you have anybody else shooting the Bismarck? Has the Bismarck lost any... any has he taken damage? Looks like he's taken 900 damage. Um, maybe 800. No, you don't torp the Gaide because it's not going to matter. Torp the Bismarck. We're here with Torps. Torps can affect the Bismarck. I mean, if you actually do strike the Gaide, that would be hilarious. You might get the middle Torp into him. Oh my god, is he dead. Ha! Okay, so it is what it is. He might actually burn out. No, he wouldn't burn out because you wouldn't have lit a fire. But you did kill him with a flood. Congratulations. Cool. Congratulations <laughs> to you. So we're on the Bismarck, and other people are shooting him now. Now we can strike the Bismarck because he's actually taking shell pressure from other ships. Yeah. I see the Lo Yang again going after him. But, okay, that's fine. Lo Yang is, a, is absolutely a threat in, uh, in the mid of the match. Also, you want to start moving your carrier. Yeah. However, yeah. it looks like y'all are not holding anywhere, so this is really tough. Lo Yang smoked again? You, you don't want to run your carrier all the way to the 7 line. Because by the time you get there, you're going to have a battleship shelling you. You know, so you're moving it to like the 5-6, I-5, I-6, I J-5, J-6. Sucks to run, but your left flank isn't holding. 
your right flank isn't holding, so you're just going to get overrun. It sucks. Oh, good. He's killing your sub now. How amazing. Jesus. No, you need to lead more. You got to hit, but be aware that they can... Uh, a, de a destroyer can lurch forward. Too close with the reticle. Because when you curl, you need the room to curl. That's a whole bunch of mouse keyboard fighting craziness there. You lose a plane before you drop, you just drop with a single plane, you're wasting time. Uh, he's going to smoke. That is good though. Getting him to burn a consumable is good. So in that sense, it was very good that you stayed. You need to work on the Bismarck on the 8 line, because you need room to yeah. run. Oops. Oh my god. Come on, stupid planes. Uh, okay. So right now, the Bismarck has no shell pressure. So he's going to go where he wants to go, which is toward the center cap and toward the other battleships that he wants to shoot. So, as long as you recognize where the Bismarck wants to go, you can approach from the side. Um, you save your heal until that plane latches, which should be very soon. Three, two, one, heal. Heal now to heal through the fighter damage. Bombs. Because without having shell pressure on a Bismarck, he can turn however the hell he wants. And it's going to be very hard to land torpedoes when a ship can turn however the hell they want. As we can see. Two drops, two torps. Could you have dropped better? Yeah, maybe. But the Bismarck can do whatever he wants. There's nobody shooting the Bismarck. So because of that, we have no control to keep him in a position so that we can actually shoot him in the first place which is why bombs are going to be the better choice because we know how to curl bombs so that even against an evasive target we can still be influential and it sucks that we're sitting here trying to solo a bismarck i mean it'll be great in terms of damage numbers but it's extremely low in terms of influence because we're going to spend five and six minutes hitting this dude, not killing him, over and over and over again, but there's nobody else here, because half your team is dead. Uh, your team went on like a little excursion on the 910 line, which basically just took their guns out of the fight for a while. Now remember, when you're curling, you want to... There's that starboard to port interaction, right? Don't turn in too early. You want to you wanna go over the midline of the ship so that you can cut in. You're turning in too early. No, you can't use torps because he's not being shot. You have to use bombs. Because you cannot guarantee that you're going to have a torp interaction on him. Now granted, earlier today, or earlier in this match, you basically, you dev struck a DD. Fucking great, amazing. But that's relying on somebody doing the wrong thing. You can't assume that the enemy does the wrong thing. You have to assume that the enemy does the right thing and be pleasantly surprised when they do the wrong thing. And the Bismarck, by the way that he's played, shows you that he knows how to play against carriers. He's maneuvering actively against you to mitigate the damage. Which is going to make it extremely hard to kill him because it's going to drag out the fight. But honestly, there's nothing else for you to interact with other than maybe trying to go after the Lo Yang or something. So, in this case, the Bismarck had a fighter showing, so you could have pre-dropped, but it's too late. It's okay. I don't think there's a way to recover this one, so mostly it's just working on uh, getting getting good interactions.
Yeah, I don't think we'll win this one. Oh well. Don't yeah, that's, you are not going to make up for four or five dead teammates. So, you'll hit the Bismarck a few times. Your damage number will look pretty at the end of the match. But there's no way to, to bring this... There's no way to bring this back. So you had three ships that were on the 910 line not shooting for approximately four to five minutes. So while their team was shooting your team and your team is losing health, your team was not shooting theirs. So they were not losing health. And it's just, you can't, that's not a way to win. So what do we see here? The Bismarck has nobody shooting him. So the Bismarck turns and does whatever the hell the Bismarck wants, which means he takes a single torp. So this is where the power of the US line comes in in that you have a very accurate interaction with your bombs but the torps are very powerful. You didn't lead far enough. You might only get one yeah, torp there. I fully slowed down. Nope, you get reason. no torps, so... <clears throat> it's a waste of time to keep going through. All your planes are dead. Should go yeah. back to uh, bombs. I thought he was slowing down for some reason. Now, you could rocket the Bismarck, because rocket planes are fast enough that... They'll be spotted and they'll be on top of you more quickly than people will tend to turn. Most people don't look at planes on the minimap. Most people are aware of planes when they hear their AA go off. Ba 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 ba. What? What? Planes? Where are planes? And then they look around, they see it, and they start to turn, or they start to maneuver, or whatever. Most players don't look at the minimap to be aware of what's coming. And rocket planes are so quick in their interaction that they will zip through AA and take the shot often before the enemy is able to make some radical course adjustment. So. You know, bombs are great in the sense that they're very accurate and they can track a target that's maneuvering. Rockets are similar, although they are more punished when a target does turn because it's a broadside interaction. If they just juke off a little bit, then you're going to lose a lot of your potential damage. You're striking into a fighter, and the Talin has no shell pressure, so he's just going to turn in on your torps. Might get one. Also, CV's coming after you. Notice where your broadside is. You should be dropping a fighter to cover your broadside. Although it might get shot down by the Talin at this point, because he's pretty close. But it's still something to pay attention to. Whoa! You gonna walk out in front of a Talin? Uh, hey, buddy, how you doing? This is my side. What do you think of my side? <laughs> well, at this point, that's really matter. No, it doesn't. You like these stretch marks over here? Oh yeah! Mm -mm. <laughs> Give me a pinch. <laughs> he might burn. I was gonna say he might burn out, but uh, I'm sure one of those uh, battleships will generously donate a shell to the cause oh, to uh, send you back to port. Oh, auto pilot, that's good. Let's go forward. Yeah. Fuck it. <laughs> so, when you're really close to an island. Uh, the autopilot can actually assume that you're beached. Because the autopilot is programmed to assume that, like, one kilometer off of an island is actually a dead zone. So when you're as close to that island as you are to be able to juke shells, any position you want to move to is too close, so your, your carrier will try to leave the vicinity of the island to be able to then come back in and take a new position. So as close as you were, you needed to manually pilot. You can't autopilot that. Yeah, but hey, look at this. Your damage number is beautiful. Hey, 111,000. Oh, mwah, perfection. <laughs> but unfortunately, in order to win a game, you have to win at least one flank. And you didn't. You had a DD that got murdered by a low Yang. You had a sub that got murdered by a low Yang. Uh, nothing really happened on the A line and, or sorry, the, the left flank and the right flank. Their guys were on the 7 8 line. Your guys were on the 9 10 line. And they just, the 9 10 line didn't win. So, as a carrier, there's only so much you can do. There was, I don't think there was a way to pull that back. Maybe there were some more influential strikes, but I didn't really see them. So, sometimes you do just have to hit the fuck it button and just. Start attacking the nearest battleship. <laughs> well, but at least I didn't have this um, beautiful camo on my CV. Yep. <laughs> it seems a way for camo. Oh, yeah, the spring sky. Warp, warp. Um, 
But you did what you could. And honestly, going after the battleship was what you needed to do. Because the battleship had broken the line. Like that battleship, the Bismarck, is threatening the sides of all the... You had two or three ships on the four line. He was threatening your position. Obviously, he's running you off to the edge of the map. Because he's just... Eh, fuck it. He's just charging down mid. So, tough times, man. In order to win, you have to win at least one flank. And you didn't win either. So, it is what it is. Yeah, it's fine. I think we have quite a few good matches. It's just, you know, nothing we can do. But uh, it was fun getting two torps onto the DD. <laughs> yes, that was... Uh, that Mary. was... That was... Uh, wow. Oh, man, that's yeah. going to happen. <laughs> and the best part is he turned in where he would have actually... Uh, one of the torps wouldn't have armed. But after he turned in, he turned back out. <laughs> <laughs> so he let them both arm and kill him. <laughs> oh wow, you know, see these coming. So, whoops! Come on, just die already. <laughs> so let's think about, you know, one of the things that we did see highlighted here which was the torps on the Bismarck. You torped the Bismarck, I think, four times, and I believe you got three torps into him because there was nothing to lock him in place. Now, there's, you know, there's the talking point or whatever. CVs create instant crossfires. There's nothing you can do. Yeah, you didn't create an instant crossfire there. You didn't crossfire him by yourself. Now you could have, you could have dropped torps at a distance to try to encourage him to stay bow onto the torps and then came in from the side. But all that means is instead of having two attacks on him, you only have one attack because the first one is just trying to set the line. Realistically, if you're gonna torp something, you need to have some kind of teammate interaction to keep them in a position for you to torp them. Rockets will be more flexible. Rockets are very fast. They're flexible for trying to get to an emergency situation and see if, oh shit, if I can just do 5,000 damage here, you know, my battleship might not be dead. And you can try to zip across the map with very fast rocket planes. And then bombs, because we just practiced in the training room, are highly able to track maneuvering targets. So even when the Bismarck didn't want you to hit them, you are still able to hit them with bombs. So let's go again. Yes, the dev strike was hilarious. Hey, it's your boy, Mr. Moneybags. Oh, this would be fun. Kid's going to be very hard to deal with. Uh, rolling with a Kiv? Kiv? Why, why? What? I guess to provide a smoke screen? Strange. I don't quite understand that interaction. That seems a little different. But at the same time, the kid can hold down some front stuff while the Kiv is doing stuff in the back. So maybe it's just for a balanced division. Um, <clears throat> cool. Action stations. You think those unicorns will be playing cults? <laughs> I guess not. Oh, is that a unicorn CB? It's in Yobo on the, you know, somewhere, also your boy on the one of those hurricane, the hurricane clans. Oh, something I boy. I didn't recognize the name. I'm just a dirty North American. <laughs> All right, so as you're crossing the center of the map, you're going to want to start keeping your boost at the ready in case you get you trip across the Riga, you trip across the kid or something. Start turning. Start turning. As soon as you see a battleship, you're about to be shot by a cruiser. So rather than give away your health for free, start turning away. Start turning away. Start turning away so you can keep kind of kiting and seeing what's on the front line. You want to give information to your team.
So now you're starting to get at the end of your scouting run, you want to start looking for a target. You might just go ahead and uh, pre-drop and then strike, you know, something that you see. But you have an idea of where every, all the assets are and where they're going. So if you could strike the Riga, that would be great because I don't think that, no, the Riga does have a heal, it's tier 9. But still, it's a good target. So, woo. And don't watch it. Yeehaw. So bombs are the correct choice. Why? Because torps, the US torps are very slow. They require people to lock the target in place and you don't have that right now, which is why you chose bombs, which is great. Good choice. Like the bomb pick. There is a DD pushing Bravo, so you could help your Bliss, your Wis. Wiscavita. That's I always say that wrong. I need a sound boyer, a soundboard where like I, I finally get the word right and I can just hit the button and it says it for me. Oh, cool, there you go. So you're gonna be this dude's best friend. Now you have to remember that when you make the drop, you're gonna have to hard turn to the left, away from the cruiser AA, so that you can bomb this guy multiple times. Hard left, hard left, hard left, hard left, hard left, hard left. There you go, away from the Brindisi. Cool. Brindisi's gonna have a lower amount of AA range anyway, which means you're not gonna be stuck in it for too very long. But you do get to force the smoke on the moss, and hopefully the Bliss would take some more shots, which he seems not to be interested in doing for some reason. But you did at least get a smoke screen there. So that's cool. Now you can use your torpedoes, because you've got that's friends funny. that are gonna be shooting the bad mans. Try to cruise control. Don't just throw away your boost. You can also move up a little bit, because their front line really hasn't moved up either. So you could move up about whoa, about half a grid square, maybe. <laughs> you basically want about a grid square between you, your surface detection and the enemy's front line, so it gives you some room to maneuver. <clears throat> huh, which still. So do you think we should go help the Tenma with the kid and key as well after this? Um, you have to win. In order to win the game, you have to win a flank. Spot the moss. Spot the moss. Spot the... Oh, God, the voice is just, like, not able to do anything. I guess you work on the Brindisi, then. Who is also <laughs> in smoke, so now you respot the moss. Um, in order to win the game, you have to win a flank. And I don't think this flank is set to win yet. It's still in flux. So you, yeah, you want to twerp uh, across the moss to stop him from running away. Oh, you're really close though. But you are keeping him lit, which is also good. So put if you put mm, this mm. angle is just going to have him. Angling away from your torps, but still angling away from your team. If you wanted to torp this, you wanted to torp at an angle that's going to stop his forward fleeing movement to cause him to stay closer to your team so that they can land hits. I think you actually just killed him there. Good. Yep. Work on the other DD. Or the Brindisi if you can. Brindisi kills your CAG, so that sucks. Uh, they're still trying to figure out this flank, so... Now, this angle is not good, because if he turns to avoid your torps, he's just moving away from your team. But he actually turned the opposite way, so he eats a torp there. Possibly two. Where do you, why do you have DD players like this? <laughs> why does this exist? <laughs> Alright, cool. Well, he didn't die there, because he ultimately decided to turn the correct direction, but like, what?! <laughs> This is not reality. <laughs> no, they're my friend. I just pay them to, you know, to, to make me look good. Okay. So the destroyer is running off. The Z-31 is not a high-impact boat. Uh, it's got excellent guns. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of DPM, but it has extremely accurate guns. But you do want to keep working on that so that people don't have to worry about it anymore. Also, because the kid and the Kia of working together uh, could really just bully down your planes. Don't blow through all your boost. Try to cruise control if you can. Try to find that Z-31. It's probably off to the left more, because you got detected early. Go to the left more. Here we go. Our team has taken the lead. 
Unfortunately, none of your surface ships can take shots here. Which is okay. You're gonna kind of harass them for a little bit. The Bliss actually might have shots soon. Maybe. But after you finish this interaction, you know, and you've kind of given ideas to where he is, you might want to hit F3 on the target just to say, Hey guys, there's a thing over here! Cool. Now in this case, you don't actually... Good. Well, now you don't have to worry about it. Now you can recall. I was gonna say, you don't actually want to bomb again because the DD, your friend, was actually taking shots. And as long as you were able to keep him lit with your last two planes, you'd be giving him that damage interaction. But you killed him, so you don't have to worry about that shit. So, uh, in this case, I don't think Torps are the correct answer, because you could rocket a Kiev or rocket the kid. Trying to work down the battleships that are completely full health is a little preemptive right now. If you can remove the DDs, you remove a lot of that uncertainty and that, that strange threat. But uh, I guess you could try to work on the Izumo because he's pushed forward. Also, drop a fighter here. So, when you're going into an attack like this, yes, you have destroyers, but you don't have a lot of vision. On, oh god, you might just bail. Just bail. Oh, are you gonna make it? Holy shit! He made it, but he couldn't see. Bail. Recall. Get out. Get out. Leave. Oh, yeah, so all that plus a kid was just too much. So you got rocket planes. Can you work on the Kiv? Can you work on the Lepanto? So the Izuma was initially, like, looking to lead the charge, and then I guess he went, wait, what the fuck am I doing? And he just slowed down and nosed out. So that was no longer going to be a thing that he was doing. Yeah, Lego Party. Got big stream dreams. Isn't that, a, isn't that an ad for Netflix? Okay, cool. So there's a Kiev. You can definitely take shots on that. Or the Riga, but the Kiev is going to be the better choice. Hard turn to the left to get away from the AA. Good moves. Sucks that the shells didn't hit, or the rockets didn't hit, but it is what it is. And let's get a fighter down outside of AA. Let's get a fighter down outside of AA when you can. Obviously you're committed at this point, so you can't. Oh, don't look for the DD. What are you doing? Oh, that's complete- no. <laughs> I think I'm gonna go for the Ponto because of the, the old shot in the So the next time you find yourself falling into a into a wood chipper, and you're feeling your bones get ripped apart, and your body is like being just flayed, don't take the time to start making yourself a salad. That's not the time to fix yourself a sandwich, to crack open, you know, like open a peanut butter can so that you can start getting some peanut butter on the bread. You need to get yourself out of the wood chipper. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, it's gonna take precedence. <laughs> so, don't, don't greed for the DD that you can't see while four ships are shooting you in the face. <laughs> Just yeah. do what you're gonna do and be done with it. Choice. Let's try to work on the Kiv. Let's try to yeah. work on the Kiv because he's isolated enough that there's not crazy amounts of AA. At this point, you know, the enemy team is riding pretty close. So you gotta, you have to peck at the outer, you have to peck at the edges of what's going on. If you could get the Kiv, that'd be great. If you could work on the Riga, that'd be great. Uh, the Lepanto has too much health, so he's playing dances with DDs. And uh, hopefully the Z31 yeah, so makes sure. that happen. But you could certainly rocket the Riga. And the Kiv is not moving, so hopefully RNG bless. Please, 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 please. That looks good. Cool. Uh, you could bomb the Riga, actually. Nope, uh, you're too far gone. Bomb. Don't chase the Lepanto. The Lepanto does not matter. You need to work on the stuff that does matter that's in A. So... Whatever that's going to be, stuff that gets kills. If you can get the Riga down, that's going to be great. This is a coaching session, Crimson. Uh, I'm over the shoulder in Discord with him. Destination reached. Autopilot mode disabled. So the Riga might come out in the corner. You do have a heal. That's a Musashi, though, so the Musashi's AA is pretty shit. Ideally, you want damage on the Riga, but he's turning out, so you have to strike the Musashi instead. 
you also need to heal so that your planes get to the target. If the Riga committed forward, you might have some kind of attack, but the Riga is kiting out, so you do not. You also might end up spotting the kid briefly, which means he might uh, hammer you with crap loads of AA. Start your attack as early as possible so that you can maybe get a drop before he gets to the island. Cool. Uh, unfortunately, most of your armaments are not very effective at this point, but you did get another flood. That might stick. Autopilot mode enabled. Would I like to see CVs and cots? I find CVs to be interesting, so sure, I think it'd be interesting, but they're not going to be in COTS because COTS is not known to have CVs in it. You don't actually have to do that. You didn't have to pre-drop there. Musashi AA is terrible, and unless the kid wanted to help out with his AA, which at the moment he seems reticent to do, you could have gotten two drops on the Musashi. Hard turn off to the right, away from the Riga, away from the kid. Yeah. You're turning instead toward the Riga, which means your planes are dead. If you had the additional squadron, if you hadn't pre-dropped, you might have been able to follow through and bomb the Riga, but it probably wouldn't be a kill. So if you're able to bomb the Wasashi, spin around, and then come in and bomb it a second time, you might have a little yeah. more fire pressure. It would be nice. Watch out for the kids, AA. Start your attack on the Musashi behind the islands to block his AA. It's not a lot, but every bit matters. Start your attack on the Musashi, start your attack on the Musashi, start your attack on the Musashi. You can probably get a kill here. Drop and start turning. Hard turn to the right, set up the line for the follow-up strike. You did get a flood that might stick. He's healing, so probably don't get a kill here, but you can hurt him and get your bombs out before you die. Bombs. Might as well go after the kid, no? Nope. nope. Don't go for the kid. Going for the kid's not going to do anything. RNG might bless you with tons and tons of bomb hits, and that would be amazing. But you go for the kid, he uses defensive fire, you lose four planes, you drop him once, he's not dead, and the Musashi isn't dead either. If you strike the Musashi by avoiding this fighter, by avoiding the fighter, by avoiding the fighter... Oh, okay, so these planes are dead. Um, if you strike the Musashi, you could set fires, and I think his damage con was down. Yeah. But at the same time, the Riga had moved up to support, so... It's all bad shots at this point. Uh, you do have a heal, so you might be able to kill the Masashi. I don't know how much, uh, how many heals he has left. Save your boost. Save your boost. So, when you burn all your boost going from point A to point B so that you get to point B faster, when you get to point B, you don't have any boost left. So, cruise control or pay attention to how much boost you're using. Start your attack because you're gonna lose a bunch of planes here, so at least when the attacking planes get closer, they'll have some kind of damage resistance. He's pulling forward, I think. That won't be a kill because he's healing. But still, you know, you did what you could. Rockets. Uh, see, I don't know about bombs. You might be able to bomb the kid. I suppose you could try. You'd need four to five bombs to kill him, though, which is just really unlikely. But rockets are fast enough you could shoot something before you die. Maybe. Uh, let's practice the bombs, since we have a life target. Left more. So when you drop there, he just slides out. You need to read this power slide. You need to read the movement of the ship. So you wanted your reticle to be slightly to the left of where you see it blurrily on the screen. Uh, oh well. 
Yeah, that was the purple cleanse. Yeah, I mean, you you had already said like, wait, why aren't they playing cots? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so they're probably they're gonna know what they're doing. They might be testing out somebody or it's a friend or whatever. Um, yeah, so you did what you could do. Uh, you did decisively win the left flank. You got, uh, I think you got a nice bomb kill on the Z31 that was bailing. So that that was pretty cool. Unfortunately, though, your team moved forward to uh, fight the enemy to take it, you know, take it to the bad guys. And as they did, they got picked off one by one. So you as a CV are not going to a you can't heal your friends. You can't smoke your friends. So if they're going to charge in and die one at a time, well, that's going to be their choice. So, it's a free country. I can do what I want. Yeah, you do what you want to do. <clears throat> Kotz is already over? What? Not bad. Then your boy does not need to play in the qualifying round. Oh, there you go. So, they're probably seated. Well, uh, thanks for your time. I think I'm going for dinner now. Okay. Well, something to eat. So, uh, yeah, I'll let, uh, good luck with your COTS qualify stream. Well, yeehaw. All right, man. Thank well, you for your help. have a good one, sir. Thanks. Bye.